it's a thrill to be able to introduce Professor Riker anytime I can. Um, he was marooned as, on a crimin, as a criminal in, in Australia for many years until he was able to leave and join us in the United States. Uh, Professor Riker uh, is really an amazing character, and, and, and those of you who have not had a chance to take either his class in international human rights or in, in um, Holocaust law ought to take the opportunity because it's a, a class that's really interdisciplinary and, uh, um, uh, and, and expose you to a wide range of, of, of uh, areas. Um, the thing, uh, Professor Riker is the scholar in residence in our Holocaust Institute and really is, uh, is, is probably uh, one of the best known faculty members outside of this building. He speaks all around the country and all around the world. Uh, uh, he gives CLE programs, uh, uh, he gives speeches, he's uh, spoken at the Eisenhower Center for instance recently in, uh, in, uh, in Kansas. And, and um, speaks at, at various locations around the country and around the world. He was on uh, the United States Holocaust Museum uh, um, Board of Directors, Harry? That's not what it's called, is it? Council. Um, the thing I want to just mention uh, that I think is most important or most uh, uh, illustrious of, 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 of him is uh, Harry started off as a simple tax lawyer uh, well, maybe not so simple. He was, a, he was a very complex tax lawyer who appeared in front of the high court in Australia and, and in the United States and uh, turned to his passion. And um, he's the person who is responsible more than really anyone else in the United States for making the Holocaust law uh, a topic of study. Of course, a lot of colleges and universities have courses about the Holocaust, about about um, the perpetrators of the Holocaust, and about the history of the Holocaust, about the reasons for the Holocaust, and about the victims of the Holocaust, uh, including my mother. Uh, but Harry uh, is the first, really, and the expert to talk about the legal issues of the Holocaust. So he has spent much of his entire adult, much of his adult life, talking about the legal issues, because, as he will tell you, everything happened legally in the in in the Holocaust up until the point in which it was too late and it was illegal. And um, his crowning achievement is that Oxford University Press, which is probably one of the major printing houses in the world, is going has recently approved his syllabus for uh, a textbook, a case book, on um, Holocaust law. And uh, this will be a book which will be used really around the world and in libraries around the world, studied by scholars and lawyers and judges. And, um, it's just really wonderful that on the front page, his name will be associated with Toro Law Center. So please welcome a great scholar, a wonderful human being, uh, Harry Riker. Thank you, Dean Rifle. There is an irony in a country which began its history, importing criminals from England, and now exports lawyers. <laughs> it's a great thrill for me to be here today. There was a sense of exhilaration as a, I was driving along the Belt Parkway and the Southern State Parkway. It's been many months since I've been able to be here or to be anywhere, actually. Uh, I had uh, some terrible back problems necessitating surgery and I've been recuperating and uh, Dean Rafel actually came to visit me at the rehab center and as he put it to me over the phone it was not a pretty sight or in the words of the great Yiddish comedian Shimon Jigan you had to look at me twice to see me once uh, it gives me tremendous pleasure and a great sense of pride really to be able to express my profound gratitude and appreciation to Dean Patricia Sulkin, to former Dean Lawrence Rafel, and to Associate Dean Deborah Post for the kindness, the decency, the sympathy, the empathy, and the compassion which they showed towards me when dealing with the various issues arising from my incapacity. Uh, gratitude and appreciation run very deep in the Riker family genes and 
It's a great source of pride for me to be able to express that on a public occasion. I'm also grateful to my colleague, Professor Dan Derby, who stepped in at very, very short notice and took over the teaching of my international human rights course. And last but not least, I express my gratitude and appreciation to all my friends among the faculty, the staff, and the students who expressed sympathy and concern and uh, wished me well as I was on my way to recovery. The Nazi regime in Germany left in its wake numerous dates which continue to live in infamy. One of those was the night of November the, the 9th and the 10th when Germans went on a hideous rampage wreaking terrible destruction on Jewish-owned property, both communal as well as personal. A pogrom which showed the brutality of the regime at its rawest form. Two days later, on November the 12th, 1938, Hermann Goering convened a conference to discuss Kristallnacht its successes, its failures, to consider its aftermath and to plan for the future. At that conference, he opined that if a good Aryan got onto a crowded train and walked into a compartment where there were no seats available, that good Aryan was entitled to grab a Jew by the scruff of the neck and throw that Jew out of the compartment. Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the mad propaganda genius of the Nazi regime who was present on that occasion, immediately chimed in, no, no, I don't agree with that. There must be a law. And it makes you wonder what was going through that man's mind. A re regime of which he was a member was capable of orchestrating Kristallnacht and two days later, he was worried about a law being necessary to throw a Jew off a crowded train. And that leads into the conundrum, which really lies at the heart of this presentation. For to utter the terms law and holocaust in the same breath may in fact be to articulate the ultimate oxymoron. When we think of the Holocaust, we think of a relatively brief period in historical terms. The Nazi regime was in power in Germany for a mere, quote unquote, 12 years, 1933 to 1945. For the victims, it was an eternity, if not longer. During that relatively brief period in historical terms, demonic forces were unleashed with a fury unparalleled in the annals of civilization, leaving in their wake untold misery, suffering, pain, destruction, devastation, and death. The absolute antithesis of everything which we normally associate with the notion of law. When we think of law, law connotes in the human consciousness characteristics and values such as justice, Order, orderliness, fairness, due process, protection of the individual against the excesses of government, even morality, some or all of the above. And so that leads directly into the central question. When we talk about the Holocaust, what on earth does law have to do with all of this? When we think in terms of legislation, which is the focal point of today's discussion, we in the West, in a Western democracy, think in parliamentary terms. We think in terms of regular elections every two years in the case of a Congress, every four years for a president and an administration, every six years on a rotating basis for the Senate. We pick our electors, our representatives, we send them to a capital city, they sit in a parliament, in a congress, 
They introduce laws, they discuss them, they debate them, they amend them, and eventually they're passed in some form, and the chief executive signs them into law. During the Nazi era in Germany, legislation meant nothing of the sort. During the 12 years of Nazi rule, the Reichstag, the German parliament, the German Congress, passed a grand total of four laws, three of them being the infamous Nuremberg Laws of September the 15th, 1935, to which I will return in a few moments. For the rest, the regime governed by executive orders. Executive orders meant no more than that someone sat down, drafted a few lines, perhaps a few paragraphs, even a few pages, and then one or more of Hitler and his cronies in cabinet put their signatures to it, and that was the law. In 1936, Professor Karl Lowenstein of the University of Munich Law School and a member of the Munich Bar, who was teaching at Yale Law School at the time, published an important article in the Yale Law Journal. And in it, he counted something of the order of 4,000 of these executive orders in the first three years of Nazi rule. In other words, during the 12 years of Nazi rule, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of these executive orders. In relation to the Jews, nearly 2,000 executive orders were promulgated, directed solely and specifically and directly against the Jews. Those laws, ranged along a spectrum. At one end, there were the quasi-constitutional Nuremberg Laws of September the 15th, 1935, quasi-constitutional because they enshrined the heart of Nazi racial ideology, which lay at the heart of the regime and drove it mercilessly for 12 years. At the other end of the spectrum, there were, spectrum, there were laws regulating absurd minutia such as the law that said you can't buy flowers from a Jewish ve flower vendor, you can't buy milk from a cow owned by a Jew, as absurd as that. It wasn't always that way, of course. Wilhelm Frick, the Minister for the Interior, testified at Nuremberg that before 1933, when the Nazis came to power, for something to become a law in Germany, it required the active participation and involvement of three parties, the President, the Reichstag, the Parliament, and the Cabinet. Shortly after the Nazis came to power, the Reichstag delegated its authority to the Cabinet, and the Reichstag therefore fell out of the picture. It was summoned only on ceremonial occasions when Hitler wanted to make a major address to the nation. And over a period of time, by virtue of the Führer Prinzip, the Führer Principle, the Cabinet also fell out of the picture. In 1937, the Cabinet stopped meeting altogether, and in 1942, this was retrospectively uh, given legislative imp imprimatur. The Führer Prinzip meant the aggregation of all governmental power, legislative, executive, and judicial, in very few sets of hands and ultimately in one set of hands, namely those of the Führer himself. Hitler was at once the chief legislator, the chief executive, and the chief justice. The Nazis were no respecters of law. They had contempt for law. They saw law, legal process, and legal institutions as merely tools for implementing their ultimate goal, which was the racial ideal. There are many ways of illustrating the Nazi contempt for law. One can point, for instance, to Hitler's speeches railing against the judges and telling them in no uncertain terms that they had to, quote, meet the needs of the hour. In other words, get it right. Judge as I want you to judge. And telling them in bald, blatant terms, if you don't get it right, I reserve the right to reach down into the judicial system and remove you from office, as bald and as blatant as that. Albert Speer, 
Hitler's personal architect who became his minister for munitions, records an episode in his uh, memoirs which resonates with me as an international lawyer. He writes about the 50th birthday party tendered in honor of the foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop. In honor of the occasion, one of the senior officers of von Ribbentrop's ministry had commissioned a magnificent present for his boss, an ornately carved oak dispatch box of the sort that one sees gracing the center table in the House of Commons in London, encrusted with semi-precious stones. And the object of, of uh, commissioning this beautiful present was that they were going to collect all the treaties, all the international agreements into which Germany had entered while Joachim von Ribbentrop was foreign minister and they were going to put them into that box. After the presentation, all those present sat down to a convivial dinner. And over the dinner table, the officer of the department who had commissioned the present and who had made the presentation was chatting with Hitler and he remarked that in collecting all of the treaties to put into this box, he had had trouble finding a single treaty which Germany had not violated. And Albert Speer records that upon hearing this, Hitler cracked up with laughter. Contempt for law. And yet there was this obsession. The figure of 2,000 laws, the precise number actually was 1,973, I know because I've counted them. Uh, the figure of nearly 2,000 laws directed against the Jews is stark in and of itself, but it takes on even grimmer mien when one puts it into perspective. In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, Jews comprised a little under 1% of the population of Germany. And by a process of natural attrition and emigration that fell during the 1930s, so that in 1939 they comprised a little under a half of 1% of the population. Yet despite comprising such an infinitesimal proportion of the population, this massive torrent of laws was poured out against them. Against that background, let's isolate a number of major themes in the legislation. But before we do that, let's first lay some simple ideological foundations. It's a truism to say that legislation in any society does not spring up out of thin air. It's always the application of an underlying philosophy, Weltanschauung, if you like. And therefore, a useful analytical tool for purposes of looking at the Nazi legal system is to see the Nazi party as a political party, which it was. And the aim of every political party is to organize itself, to field candidates for office, to have those candidates elected, preferably in numbers large enough to form a government, and then once in government, to implement its party platform as reflective of its underlying party philosophy. So if we look at it in those terms and take one extra step and put ourselves in the shoes of the mythical legal counsel to the Nazi party, who's sitting in his office on January the 31st, 1933, the day after Hitler was sworn into power, the task of our, of our office as legal counsel is to put forward a legislative program for the Reichstag to enact. How do we go about our task? The best and simplest way would be to reach onto the bookshelf, take down a copy of Hitler's infamous tract, Mein Kampf, where he sets out his whole philosophy for all to see, go through it page by page, section by section, and at each point we ask ourselves what legislation is necessary in order to give effect to this idea. If we do that, there's a startling consequence that emerges 
because we see a sick, perverse logic in the legislative scheme that emerged. In other words, it emanated so naturally, even inexorably, from the underlying philosophy of the Nazi party that we can almost say that the Nazis were unusual politicians in that they kept their word. It was there for everyone to see and it was translated into a legislative system. The legislative system makes perfect sense when one sees it against the background of the underlying philosophy. Theme number one, the theme of definition. This was the fulcrum around which everything revolved because if your aim is to attack Jews, you have to know who is a Jew. Initially, when the Nazis came to power, they had this bizarre hypothesis that you could isolate a Jewish blood type. And if they would only do enough research, they would isolate this blue Jewish blood type. And once they had the Jewish blood type isolated, you could determine who was a Jew with a simple prick of, of the finger. Of course, those efforts um, fell ignominiously into a heap, as they were bound to do. But in the meantime, a lot of research funds were spent and a lot of researchers made a very nice livelihood, thank you very much, uh, res doing this pseudo-scientific research trying to isolate the Jewish blood type and whole academic journals, pseudo-academic journals, were started, devoted to the theme of isolating the Jewish blood type. And there's uh, uh, weird correspondence, which would be funny if it weren't so serious, from major research institutes, and Germany was the center of the world as far as scientific research was concerned in the 1920s and 30s, uh, going back to Berlin, uh, saying how they were uh, close to a major breakthrough and thanking the Fuhrer for the opportunity to uh, make such a major contribution to humankind. When all of that failed, they res fell back on a general definition. And that general definition was expressed in the first ordinance to the Nuremberg Laws. And that was promulgated on November the 14th, 1935. The basic definition of the Jew was that a Jew is someone who has three Jewish grandparents who are Jewish by race, and then if the quest that transposes the question, so the question is, who is a Jewish grandparent by race? The answer, said the, legi said the uh, first ordinance, is someone who was affiliated with the Jewish religious community. There was a major admission of failure here because Hitler had all along talked about Jews as being a race, which in itself is a nonsensical idea, and they had to admit failure. They couldn't define Jews by any racial characteristics, and so they had to ad admit that they were uh, on the wrong track, and, that, and for that reason they actually hid the definition in the legislation itself, so you have to sort of weave your way through it a little bit till you actually get to that bottom line that I've um, articulated. The basic definition had a devastating effect on the Jewish community. It was quite traumatic. It, for the first time, they were defined and defined as inferior. For nearly three years, the Jewish community in Germany had been the object of discrimination, of ostracism, and of dehumanization. And this formalized it in a most public and official way. The effect on individuals was shattering because by the stroke of a definitional pen, the whole self-image of a lot of people was just turned upside down. The best example I've come across is in a book by Cynthia Crane published in 2000 called Divided Lives, Jewish German Women in Nazi Germany. She interviews 12 women who were not Jewish, they weren't born Jewish, they weren't raised Jewish, they didn't think of themselves as Jewish, they weren't uh, viewed by their peers as Jewish, they didn't associate in any way with the Jewish community, and suddenly, by virtue of this definition, 
deep dark secrets in the family history came to light. And there are terrible searing stories of mothers sitting their daughters down late at night to break the news to them that their whole world had suddenly been turned upside down. Uh, there are searing passages in one after another of the uh, interviews that Cynthia Crane, uh, that Cynthia Crane uh, publishes. The memoirs, the diaries, the survivor testimony are replete with heartrending stories. There's one chapter in one book which begins along the following lines. So and so went to bed at night a Christian and woke up the next morning a Jew. And then, quote, Hitler, not God, had wrought a miracle, unquote. All of this led to a mad scramble to prove Aryanness. Uh, and it create a whole created a whole industry in fake birth certificates, fake baptismal certificates. And you read these heart-rendering, really terrible, terrible applications by people on behalf of their spouses, pleading that the spouse should be reclassified as either a non-Jew or at least one of the lower levels of Jew in the legislation, which I haven't gone into. There were devastating personal effects. Uh, it was um, one heart-rending story after another, theme number one. Theme number two, racial purity. This was an excellent example of the underlying ideology being translated into legislation. The central racial ideology was set out in Hitler's Mein Kampf. Essentially, he sees all of humankind as being divided into different racial groups, arranged in hierarchical formation with Aryans at the top and Jews at the bottom and others in between. Race and blood, which, are the, which in his view are the same thing, are determinative of everything. They're the key to everything. All progress in civilization, all progress in all fields of human endeavor are ultimately, in his view, traceable back to the Aryan races. The product of the Aryan races. And therefore, it's important to maintain racial purity because, he says, if you interbreed races, take someone from the top uh, race, the Aryans, and someone from a lower race, the progeny that emerges is somewhere in between, so you've dragged down the higher race. And that has an effect on the progress and advancement of civilization. Therefore, he says, all of history is a struggle by the higher races to prevent pollution of the blood by the lower races. The worst polluters of good Aryan blood are the Jews. So if we revert to our role as legal counsel to the Nazi party and we read this stuff, what legislation would we recommend? Obviously, we would recommend legislation prohibiting marriages between Aryans and Jews, prohibiting extramarital relations between Aryans and Jews. And if we look at the uh, law for the protection of German blood and German honor, one of the central Nuremberg laws of September the 15th, 1935, that is exactly what we see. And for good measure, they also prohibited Jewish households from engaging uh, household help who were female and under the age of 45. At 45, they were considered safe. All of this had devastating effects as well. It had devastating effects on personal relationships. It prevented marriages from taking place, which would otherwise have taken place. It broke up existing marriages, and it forced dismissals of long-standing, loyal household help who, in many cases, had become part of the family and were being considered part of the, the family. Life was turned into a nightmare. People were harassed. People were persecuted. People were turned into the Gestapo, never to be seen from again. In some cases, people were turned into the Gestapo and an urn was sent back
to the family with their ashes. All because the government decreed whom one could marry and whom one could not marry. One of the memoirs has the searing story of the famed German actor Joachim Gottschalk. He was married to a Jewish woman and heroically he refused to divorce her even though he knew that it would save him and make life easier for himself. He refused to do that. The night before his wife and their son who was Jewish uh, under Jewish law were about to be deported to Auschwitz, Joachim Gottschalk, his wife, and their son committed suicide. All of this has given rise to what I believe is the most bizarre document I've ever come across in my studies of the Nazi legal system, and perhaps uh, generally. It's the combined marriage certificate and transcript of wedding ceremony of Adolf Hitler himself. Picture the scene. It's April the 29th, 1945, deep in a highly fortified bunker under the streets, deep under the streets of Berlin. The war is lost. Germany has been comprehensively defeated on the battlefield. Hitler himself has ordered a scorched earth policy vis-a-vis -vis his own country and his own people. He himself is only hours away from committing suicide. In that context, he enters into this bizarre ceremony of marriage with Eva Braun. And the combined marriage certificate and transcript of ceremony says almost exactly in these words that the bride and the groom declare that they are both of pure Aryan ancestry. Even at that point in his life, he was obsessed with, the ra ra with racial purity. Theme number three, the right to citizenship. What I've summarized from Hitler's Mein Kampf, from his articulation, if that's the right word, of his racial ideology is only part of the picture. That's what's well known. But in fact, there's a second, less well known limb to Hitler's view of the Jews. Hitler's view of the Jews is in fact a bifurcated view. And the two views really can't stand logically together. There's an inherent tension and an inherent inconsistency between them, but we don't read Hitler for his logic. The second limb can be summarized in this way. Jews are an insidiously clever people who come into a society as strangers, as aliens. Alien dress, alien language, alien habits, alien customs, alien religion, alien practices. They gradually acculturate and assimilate into the society. And as they assimilate into the society, they identify the key levers of influence and power in the society. They make for those levers, they take them over, they take over the society and then turn the society towards Bolshevism. That, in a nutshell, is the second limb to Hitler's bifurcated view. Now, if we step back into our role as legal counsel to the Nazi party and we read this stuff, our attitude to the legislation necessary to implement it is very different to our attitude to implementing the first limb. Here, what we're aiming at is Jewish influence and power. And so we have to recommend legislation which will chop Jews off the knee, at the knees when it comes to influence and power in the society. And so the first thing we would recommend is a law depriving Jews of the right to full citizenship. That is the most direct way of access to power in a society. In any society, only citizens can vote. 
Only citizens can be candidates for office. Only citizens can be elected as candidates for office. That, as I say, is the most direct avenue of access to political power. And so we would recommend that legislation be introduced to strip Jews of their citizenship. In this country, the Supreme Court has said that citizenship is the most important right because it is the right to all other rights. Um, and there's a lot of truth in that, of course. So we see then that on September the 15th, 1935, that idea was in fact given expression to in the Reich citizenship law. And the Reich citizenship law said that non-Aryans, first and foremost Jews of course, could not be full citizens of the Reich. That law, together with the first ordinance of November the 14th, 1935, spelled out in express terms, that's what, this is what the first ordinance said, that Jews cannot vote, Jews cannot be elected to public office. We have a marvelous photo of the Nuremberg Laws themselves. This is a photograph of the original Nuremberg Laws of September the 15th, 1935. They were found in their original form by General George Patton, who decided he would like them as a souvenir, so he purloined them and uh, lodged them for many years in the Huntington Library in Los Angeles, and about three years ago, they were transferred to the uh, National Archives in Washington. And, and those documents have, among other things, the original signature of Adolf Hitler himself, plus others. We also have something else which is quite stunning. Original archival footage of the Nuremberg Laws being read out in the Reichstag on September the 15th, 1935. We'll see Hermann Goering reading them out with Hitler first having been seen introducing them and summarizing them. The soundtrack is good. The original German is clear. There are no subtitles. There are no, there's no dubbing. We don't need them because we know what's in these laws. All we need to do is sit back and listen to the harsh, guttural enunciation, spewing and barking out poison and hatred. Thank you, Peter. Die man im tiefsten Frieden überfallen und vom Reiche weggerissen hat, schlimmer behandelt werden als die normalen Staatenverbrecher. <lacht> Ihr einziges Verbrechen ist aber nur, dass Sie Deutsche sind und Deutsche bleiben wollen. Sie schlagen uns dem Reichstag die Annahme der Gesetze vor, die Ihnen Parteigenosse Reichstagspräsident Göring verlesen wird. Das erste und zweite Gesetz. Tragen eine Dankeschuld an die Bewegung ab, unter deren Symbol Deutschland die Freiheit zurückgewonnen hat. Das zweite Gesetz ist der Versuch der gesetzlichen Regelung eines Problems, das im Falle des abermaligen Scheiterns dann durch Gesetz zur endgültigen Lösung der Nationalsozialistischen Partei übertragen werden müsste. Hinter allen drei Gesetzen steht die Partei und mit ihr und hinter ihr die deutsche Nation. Artikel 1. Die Reichsfarben sind schwarz, weiß, rot. Artikel 2. Reich und Nationalflagge ist die Hakenkreuzflagge. Sie ist zugleich Handelsflagge. Reichsbürger ist nur der Staatsangehörige deutschen oder arg verwandten Blutes, der durch sein Verhalten beweist, dass er gewillt und geeignet ist, 
den Treue dem deutschen Volk und Preis zu dienen. Eheschließungen zwischen Juden und Staatsangehörigen Deutschen oder artverwandten Blutes sind verboten. <lacht> Thank you, Peter. I get a chill every time I see it, and I've seen it many, many, many times. Beyond citizenship, Jewish access to influence and power was attacked in a variety of ways. Jewish income earning capacity was taken away from them unceremoniously. They were systematically thrown out of every profession, out of occupation, every trade, every business. At the same time, on the property side, their property was unceremoniously seized from them, turning them into poverty. They were thrown out of the education system. It goes without saying how important, how central education is to influence and power. Knowledge is power, the old saying goes, and how true it is. Victor Klemperer, in his diaries, has an uncanny ability to put his finger on the pulse of a mood and capture it very pithily in a handful of words. At one point, when the doctors get thrown out of the medical profession, Peter, we won't need any more slips, thank you. When the doctors get thrown out of the medical profession, he reports in his diary with bitterness dripping out of the page, they can starve. When Jewish schools are closed, after Jewish children had been thrown out of public schools and forced into Jewish schools, he says an intellectual death sentence. Four really, really powerful words. In these and other ways, Jewish influence and power was taken away from them. And in fact, very perceptively, the United States Embassy in Berlin sent back a cable to Washington, to the State Department, saying uh, Jews are being attacked in a way designed to remove their influence from all segments of German society. In one area of life after another, Jews were battered by the laws. They were discriminated against. They were ostracized. They were, de they were dehumanized. They were deprived of their human rights as we know them today. And all legally, all by law, a very distinguished Holocaust survivor, Professor Nechama Tech, who's Professor Emerita of Sociology at the University of Connecticut in, ha Connecticut in Hartford, uh, has written very movingly about her Holocaust experiences. The first time I met her, met her was 10 years ago, and I was telling her about my interest in the Nazis' obsession with legalizing what they were doing, and she remarked with bitter sarcasm, that's right, no one ever died illegally in Auschwitz. And that's the title of today's presentation. But that's not to say that the Nazis needed laws, it's not to say that they waited until the laws were enacted before they acted on the substance of what was in the laws. They, they didn't need any of, uh, any of that. Laws were merely a fig leaf, a legal fig leaf, giving them respectability. The laws served the usual purposes which laws serve in any society. But in this particular case, there were two additional reasons which were very, very important. One was for the overseas market. They could honestly say, Mr. President, we are not a lawless society. We are a society of laws. Look at all of these laws. And they took great comfort in knowing that some of the things they were doing were mirrored in other societies. They took great comfort from the Jim Crow laws in this country. They took great comfort from laws forcing sterilization on 
mental and physical incompetence as they viewed them. In Scandinavian societies, in this, in this country, there were 30 states with um, sterilization laws on their books. And I'm not making comparisons, but I'm just saying that they uh, took great comfort in knowing that um, they were, as they saw it, a law lawful society, not a lawless society. But secondly, and very, very importantly, in the post-Bismarck era, there was a militaristic ethos in Germany which pervaded the country. It permeated the legal, not, sorry, it permeated the home, it permeated the school system, and one of the hallmarks of the militaristic ethos was a tendency to obedience of a father figure. And so one of the key elements of enacting laws to give effect to what they were doing was to inure the population to what was going on because they were accustomed to obeying the law. They were accustomed to seeing the law as a source of morality. Well, it's all legal, so it must be right. There must be something wrong with these people if so many thousands of laws are being poured out against them. And that's really what Goebbels was intent on when he said at the conference two days after Kristallnacht, no, no, I don't believe in that. There must be a law. He wasn't worried about legalizing the throwing out of, of a Jew from a crowded compartment. He was concerned about the effect on the surrounding population, the other passengers in that train car. He wanted them to look up from their Goethe and Schiller and their morning newspaper, see that there was a commotion, realize that this was a Jew being thrown out. Oh, well, this is legal, of course. This is uh, all according to law and go back to reading the morning paper so that at the very least, if they wouldn't support the throwing of the Jew out, at least they would turn a blind eye to it. He was intent on inuring the population. Goebbels was a genius at understanding human nature. And his idea of legalizing what was going on was as a method of um, inculcating certain values and beliefs and acceptance of certain actions into the general population, and he was wildly, wildly successful. Let me conclude by extracting very briefly some lessons to be learnt from the Nazi legal system. First and foremost, that law is inherently neutral. In and of itself, it is neither good or bad. It really depends on whose hands it falls into. If it's ministered and administered by good, decent, compassionate people, law can be the instrument of the greatest good in a society. But if it falls into evil hands, it can be the instrument of the greatest brutality. Secondly, the Nazi legal system teaches us in the most vivid form the importance of constitutional separation of powers because the ultimate guarantee of individual liberties is a diffusion of power in a society. In the, in uh, Germany, it was the exact opposite. And whatever the imperfections of a system such as the US constitutional system, it's still a lot better than what's out there. So Winston Churchill it was who said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And what he meant was, well, there are imp imperfections in democracy because democracy is a system of government that is conceived of by human beings, is implemented by human beings. Human beings are imperfect. But it's still a lot better than any other system out there, to which I would respectfully add that the US constitutional system of separation of powers is the worst constitutional system in the world, except for all the others. Thirdly, within separation of powers, the critical importance of an independent judiciary. There was no such thing in Nazi Germany. It was all one. The judges were simply mouthpieces of the regime. Fourthly, the fragility of democracy. Bearing in mind that Hitler came to power democratically, he 
uh, came to power within the constitutional framework of the Weimar Republic, and yet within a very short space of time he could turn the whole constitutional order upside down. And that leads directly into the fifth and final lesson I would uh, learn, and that is, well, I would derive, and that is learn to take the Fuhrer at his word, quote unquote. What I mean is that if you look through Mein Kampf and other writings and speeches of Hitler and other Nazi leaders, we see that everything was set out there. He said in Mein Kampf, we're changing our tack now. This was in 1923, 24 when he wrote Mein Kampf. We're changing our tack. We're not going to try for a violent revolution. We're going to work within the system and try to come to power lawfully. But you should know that once we come to power, we're going to overturn the constitutional order. And that's exactly what he did. It was all there for anyone to read. He even talked about the principle of using poison gas to kill Jews. He said, it's just a pity that during the First World War, we didn't use poison gas to kill around 15,000 Hebrews. The course of the war might have been very, very different. He spoke about poison gas being used to kill Jews. Not, it is true, in the context of mass killing uh, concentration camps like Auschwitz, Birkenau, but the principle of using poison gas to kill Jews was there. If only enough people had taken him seriously and had acted on uh, what uh, he was threatening to do. And one of the great lessons for the modern era is that when uh, tyrants and would-be tyrants uh, make threats, you have to take them seriously, because if you take them seriously, then uh, you may do something to prevent it.